Welcome to this presentation on getting bedtime right. I, I didn't think I was going to be presenting on this particular topic. Uh, I thought all the madness around bedtime would would go away. The Ferber method, the the um, keeping the door closed until the child cried it out, and so on. I thought, uh, oh my goodness, that's so non-intuitive. Certainly, it won't uh, stick. And and it's been some time that I've been in the trenches, actually doing parent consulting, having retired some time ago. Uh, but I've had more questions recently about that from relatives, friends, uh, and stories that have come that that uh, say to me that it is getting worse, not better. Bedtime is probably one of three or four basic kinds of practices that you could say define your approach to parenting. Uh, nursing, toilet training, uh, those would be other ones. Uh, how you think of parenting, how you think of raising your child will inform these practices. And bedtime is right up there with how we respond to this should flow from our basic philosophy, our basic approach to parenting should be characterized by that. And so it, it, in a sense, says a lot about us, but it's also really important to get it right. And so I thought, well, I, I, I could do it the other way. I, I could address this topic and, uh, and in this way challenge or at least provide a check to one's approach to parenting if it is truly coming from an attachment-based attachment, attachment -based developmental approach, which this, of course, will because uh, that's my middle name, so to speak. That's, uh, that's exactly what our, I articulate is an attachment-based developmental approach. Now, those of you that are familiar with this approach know that everything starts with making sense of. If we can't make sense of a problem, we're not going to really be informed with how to how we address it. And so it's making sense of bedtime. But lest you think that this is just about babies and toddlers and preschoolers and maybe young children, uh, I, the, the issue of bedtime is actually probably one of the most significant issues of all of parenting. And uh, you'll see why in just a minute. So again, everything starts from making sense of it. Uh, from there, we get our instructions. We should get our instructions. Now, just a caveat here. Uh, what I have to share with you may not solve every bedtime issue. However, it should give you the conceptual tools you need to be able to solve your own problem. Uh, some, some of the problems get quite entrenched and take a while to resolve, but this should at least give you the idea of what should be happening, how it should be happening, and uh, also, as I said, give you the conceptual tools uh, to be able to solve the problem from. Now, everything starts, as I said, from making sense of it, and there is a foundational insight here that is absolutely essential. Everything flows from it. Everything in this presentation will flow from it, and that is that bedtime is more than anything else a time of facing separation. It is that way for our babies. It is that way for us largely as well. So noticing here we're, we're starting with, with the child, with the infant, with the teenager. We're starting with that. Not what mom and dad need. Uh, if we can get this right, mom and dad get what they need, not to go crazy, etc. But we're not going to start there. That's not how we start from an attachment-based developmental approach. We have to start with making sense of this in terms of, of how we can be the providers of what the child needs. So bedtime is a time of facing separation. Now, what's the big deal about that? Well, that's everything, really. That's everything. Uh, togetherness is our preeminent need. We are creatures of attachment. We long for togetherness. We long for contact, for connection, for togetherness in all its forms. And so facing separation is the greatest human threat. 
this is what life is about. This is the main issue in emotional health and well-being. Uh, this becomes a main issue in, in development. Is separation is highly evocative. And yet, our life is full of separation. So how do we deal with this? Uh, and bedtime is probably one of the first separations, at least on a repetitive basis, that a child is going to face. So how we can approach this is, is, is going to set the stage, so to speak, for a lot of things. Now, facing separation, uh, I've got a whole course around this, the intensive two, uh, about the impact of facing separation, but I'll just summarize it here. It triggers powerful primal emotions that stir us up and move us in automatic pre-programmed reactions to reduce the separation face. What we've learned about emotion is that emotion has purpose. And of course, the, our basic preeminent need is togetherness. So emotions, our big emotions, our primal emotions, we'll look at three in just a bit, uh, frustration, alarm, and what I call separation trigger pursuit. Uh, others have called seeking that these three emotions are primarily nature's attempt to solve the problem of separation. So what happens is it comes bedtime, a child faces separation, and you got these emotions raging in them. These emotions do not, uh, uh, they, they, are, uh, they do not induce sleep, uh, for sure. They go in the opposite direction. So how in the world do you deal with this? You see the problem, bedtime. The problem of bedtime is huge in this way. And it is meant to be huge. It, it is a problem. And it's a meant a pro it, it is a problem that that uh, cultures have uh, have addressed. And we'll get to this. Uh, this is one of the first problems that culture must address. And they have addressed traditionally. But we've lost our way, it seems. And we've lost uh, the, uh, the cultural wisdom that can inform us. Now, it switches the autonomic nervous system, which is in two branches, the work mode and the, and the rest mode. It switches it actually to the work mode, which is, of course, the opposite of what's needed for sleep, because nothing has to work more than togetherness. So as the child faces separation... It puts them in a highly vigilant mode, of course, in terms of contact and closeness. All of a sudden, they've got to go pee. I have a glass, a glass of water. Everything is around contact and closeness. The opposite of what uh, you know what what it is. And if you make the mistake in saying I, we need to get you to sleep fast tonight because uh, you know your your father and I or your mother and I will be leaving uh, to go to uh, you know out for dinner. Oh, yeah, now it's hopeless. It's absolutely a hope. It's double facing separation, triple facing separation. It's not going to happen now. And so you're, you, what you did is push the child's face into separation, and you got the uh, autonomic nervous system highly in the uh, sympathetic or the work mode, and these emotions going going there. And it can evoke defenses against the vulnerability of separation. Now, one of the first defenses is that it's not safe to depend. The baby doesn't know this. The child doesn't know this. But one of the things that we're supposed to take care of is to take care of that the child doesn't face more separation than they can handle. Because, again, we're creatures of togetherness. So if something happens that they're facing more separation than they can handle... And we've got some bad practices in today's parenting. Uh, for instance, using what uh, uh, children care about or attach to against them. And so when they're facing separation, what happens is it doesn't feel safe to depend. And there's a whole family of instincts that is meant to, to really uh, come to the fore when children uh, become adults. Uh, part of taking care of the other uh, is the alpha instincts to take charge, to be in control. Only these start to be activated when the child is merely a toddler. And so they get to all of a sudden need to be in charge, to boss the parent around, to be in control, to have the last word, uh, to tell mommy how you're going to do it, daddy, what they have to do. And it turns the whole parenting upside down. 
And these children seem strong, seem even independent. But of course, that those alpha instincts are, are, are urgent, highly elevated. And this isn't coming from a right place. This is coming from a place because it's not safe to depend. So you might see if it's not handled properly, your child becoming a bit bossy and prescriptive, always needing to be in charge, needing to be in control. This is not a good sign because that child does not feel safe to defend. There's two others that I'm going to go to in a minute, defensive detachment and defensive shutdown, which actually make the whole bedtime go a lot easier, but for all the wrong reasons. And that's one of the reasons I'm so concerned about individuals being informed uh, that uh, sleep coaches are informed about this. There's so many experts these days that, that do not have the basic understanding they need if they're going to help others uh, with this very important issue. They need to be informed uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the, the attachment dynamics that are at play here. Now, this is a developmental issue. The less developed a child's own sense of self. A self gives you a sense of permanence, a sense of stability. Uh, the self is a construct. It takes time to develop. Uh, when the baby is born, they're basically fused to the mother. When the mother disappears, they disappear in a sense. So it's, it's, it is alarming. It is hugely concerning. Uh, and so uh, it, uh, the bedtime uh, should be a bigger problem when the, when the child is young and they haven't uh, really established a, a sense of self. There's no sense of continuity, no sense of permanence uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, to know they wake up in the morning, they are the same self and so on. And also it takes a whole development. We'll take a brief look at this. Uh, a development about being able to hold on when apart or to develop the capacity for a relationship, which is the ultimate answer of preserving connection uh, when apart, when you can't be with. This takes time. It takes, it takes uh, several years to unfold and develop. And so we really need time on our side. So the construct of sleep training is exactly the opposite construct you need here. In sleep training, it suggests that self-soothing, self-regulation, that going to sleep is a skill that you have to learn. Uh, the earlier, in a sense, you learn it, as if you learn it as a, you know, a, a beginning toddler, etc., the better it is uh, to do this. Nothing could be more wrong, I don't know how to say this, more in error uh, than this, because like many issues, these are developmental issues. We need to figure out a way of compensating for the immaturity until nature can take care of itself. Nature will take care of this if the conditions are conducive. It will unfold, but we need to buy time here. We need to buy time for the sense of self to unfold. We need to buy time uh, for the capacity for a relationship to unfold, which is going to take about five or six years if all the conditions are conducive. And we'll take a, a, a brief look at that. Uh, now back to the defenses. There are two defenses that I wanted to, wanted to mention here. When the separation becomes unbearable, uh, defenses can be triggered that put the child, or in the in adult for that matter, to sleep, but for all the wrong reasons. And there's two of these. One is defensive detachment. That is, there's, the brain has the ability, the amygdala, in the gear shift of the brain, to reverse the attachment instincts from going for closeness, clinging, clutching, uh, everything is preoccupied with togetherness, to actually resisting contact and closeness. So the pursuit of proximity is reversed, usually because the separation seems unbearable. So all of a sudden it seems like the, the child doesn't need you, uh, that they're fine, they're completely independent, but if you went any further to give a hug at that point in time, you'd find a resistance to contact and connection. You find the eyes would divert. You can always tell when defensive detachment is there. You should be able to tell in your spouse as well and in yourself. This, this reaction is in all of us. When we face separation, a little bit too much to bear is that our brain says, we're out of here. And then you find this resistance to contact and closeness. It's meant to be just a transitional reaction. Sometimes it gets a bit stuck uh, for some children 
that face a lot of separation like foster children and adopted children, it can get very strongly stuck. Uh, in many children that I was involved in consulting with their parents, it actually got stuck all the way through the nighttime. So when the parents would come in the morning, the child would be resistant to contact and closeness. I have one five-year-old who tried to, to fart to pass air in her mother's face when she would come. Everything goes in reverse to make yourself odious. These children are a nightmare to manage. And so the the parent was obviously very alienated, and the parents who this happens to are very alienated uh, when uh, when their children uh, they can't collect their children in the morning. But this is because of a strong defensive detachment response. It made it easier for the, for the sleep, the bedtime, because the parents aren't as dependent upon. You don't see any panic there on the part of the child, but it's for the wrong reasons. And so your sense of it is just what happens when you try to move close, when you give that hug, when you give that, you know, the final uh, kind of cuddle. Uh, has Have you lost your child? If you've lost your child, then this is for the wrong reason. The other reason is is that the brain also has the ability uh, to do a systemic shutdown. If things aren't working well, and the way this works, uh, you remember, some of you, uh, you, most of you will have taken, if you took Psych 101 or you just read it in it, you'll, uh, you know Walter Cannon's fight-flight response. And what he was observing is the sympathetic, this is the work system's uh, response to stress. And now facing separation is the biggest threat, it's the biggest response. Now, what he didn't know and what was added at that time is that if, if the fight or flight, that is the eruption of attacking energy or all that kind of energy and all the alarm, uh, the moving to caution energy, isn't going to work, and it usually doesn't work at bedtime, uh, then what can happen is, a, is a, a swing of the pendulum to severe parasympathetic system mode. Now, the parasympathetic system is actually uh, the system that's supposed to prepare us for rest. It is the rest mode, but in its severe form, it shuts down a little bit too much. What it does is, when it's a severe, uh, very sudden form, is it dilates the blood vessels. When it dilates the blood vessels, it, uh, there's not enough oxygen that gets into the brain. Now, in uh, I, the fainting is the best example of this. Uh, you're caught in a situation, fight or flight doesn't work. I've had two situations where this happened to me, one just recently. And sure enough, the blood rushed from my head. I was in the hospital. They took my pulse uh, and my blood pressure. My blood pressure was under uh, 50, so it had just gone down to disappear. Well, what happens, technically speaking, is is my body went into a, a, a panic. I, there, there was no way to get out of it in terms of the sympathetic nervous system, and it took a wide swing uh, to the parasympathetic and uh, and in a milder milder form when it's not fainting you just get sleepy uh, and this is apparently the kind of response, the parasympathetic response, often called the freeze response, if you've heard of it, it in the literature, the fight, flight, and freeze. This is the freeze response that now is suspected of the reason why a lot of our babies, our, our neonates, went to sleep in, in the neonate nursery in the hospital. Uh, they used to be separated from mom. If some of you can remember those days. Thank goodness those days are over. But they used to be separated uh, from uh, from uh, mother. They used to sleep in a nursery, uh, a neonate nursery, and they would sleep 16 to 18 hours a day. Now, when we finally got civilized and brought the babies back uh, to uh, the mother, to the parents where they should be, these babies woke up. And they didn't need nearly that much sleep at all. And then we realized, oh my goodness, this was sleep out of defense. And so this whole idea, oh my goodness, this was emotional shutdown. Now, in the therapeutic circles, this is a big deal, uh, you know, looking at this. Uh, but not many see it as related to this very response for sleep. So that when the child, in a sense, gets, it, it, it's, it's not working, it's not working, and the, and the separation is unbearable, they can actually get drowsy and go to sleep. Parents think, all is in order. All is in order. It's not in order. That's not why 
you want a child to go to sleep. Now, when I talk about this, I often tease <laughs> tease individuals, uh, especially males. It seems us males still carry this this sleep as defense response. You know, if uh, those of you uh, 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 women who are listening this uh, to this, and if uh, uh, you have a male partner, you want to check with your partner uh, if uh, if indeed they do have the sleep response to stress. Uh, just talk about something a bit stressful. And see how long it takes for your partner to start yawning and, you know, to feel <laughs> drowsy, to feel tired. And you know exactly how this response works. Uh, the point here is, you see, is all of this stuff around that we have been doing, the Ferber method, all of these things, let the child cry it out on, on their own. All of this where you shut the door, all of this where you push the child into more separation, it just escalates and escalates. What is it doing? It is courting these defenses. And you don't want to court these defenses. The bottom line is most of our problems in, as humans all through life, most of our problems actually are rooted in having difficulties face, facing the separation we face. The rejection, the lack of belonging, the lack of significance, of worth, the lack of love, the losses, the lacks. The more you understand attachment, the more you understand what separation is. And when you realize all the ways we look for togetherness, you know, the, the greatest plague right now is loneliness. In fact, two governments have actually developed a new ministry. Britain is one of those governments who now has a ministry of loneliness. And the more research is around loneliness, this is facing separation. The bottom line is we should never treat problems that have derived from separation with separation. We should never treat problems that derive from separation with adding more separation. Now, that has a lot of implications. It has implications for discipline, uh, in, in, implications for all kinds of things uh, that, uh, that we'll go to and touch on a, a bit. But you get, you get the issue here, is this is where we've gone wrong, and uh, that's why I feel like I need to address this, because uh, this counterindicated is the cry it out alone approaches counterindicated is pushing a child's face into separation is locking the door counterindicated is the ferber method is anything a, you know a, a number of sleep training practices anything that involves the child facing more separation not less so bedtime is a prototype experience here it is very much like facing death, the, the huge place where we're facing separation. It isn't death that spooks us because we have no concept of this. We really don't understand this. We, it is separation from all that we've been attached to. This is what spooks us. The poets usually get this because they know this. It is that it is that facing separation. So bedtime is like facing death in that both are facing separation. The sleep has been referred to, as I say, quite appropriately as a little death. Uh, Homer is the first one in the Iliad to, to uh, have called it that. The Buddha did. Uh, the Hindi language, uh, it's incorporated right into the language, I am told. Uh, I, uh, um, and so you can understand why in this. So bedtime is a prototype separation experience. How bedtime is experienced and handled can influence the response to a myriad of other experiences involving separation in one way or another. Not only for how mom and dad handle separations that the child is facing, but how the child handles the separations they are facing both ways. And so hence the title of this address, Getting It Right getting bedtime right, should be a top priority uh, it, uh, because it is this, this prototype. Um, so it's, it, it is a basic challenge. It should flow from our approach. And if you are at all uh, give uh, any kind of credence to the attachment-based developmental approach, then uh, 
uh, then having it inform your bedtime practices, no matter how old the child is. Uh, and so many separations are, like bedtime and like mortality, uh, facing our death. They're inevitable. And if not inevitable, they're at least inescapable and seemingly intolerable, at least until developmentally ready. Losses, rejections, divorce of parents. A child can't control that. If it's not inevitable, at least it's inescapable if it's going to happen. And it's seemingly intolerable. And so again, or even like going to school or like kindergarten, all of these, all of these are simply different expressions. In fact, if we look at stress, Hans Selye brought this to the map, a Canadian endocrinologist looking for the common pathway, physiological response in the body. And so there was this whole idea of finding all of the different uh, circumstances that affected us in that way, that it got our autonomic nervous system going, it, it, uh, it alarmed us or frustrated us. Uh, and so there was this, this thing of looking and gathering all of these different experiences uh, that, uh, that were stressful, that had to do this. But what Hans Selye didn't know, and that was filled in a decade later when attachment theory came to the fore, is that the common denominator in all of these things is facing separation. It is facing separation. Now, I've got bedtime tucked way up there in the corner here, uh, if you can see it there. But the point is, you see, that bedtime is one of a myriad of experiences that have that theme. If we get bedtime right, can understand how to do something that's inescapable, inevitable, and seemingly intolerable of facing separation, then we have our clues uh, for, for uh, a whole lot of, of parenting. Now, as I said uh, in, I think it was a second slide, is bedtime is highly evocative. That is, facing separation is highly evocative. And I talked about it evoking three uh, primal emotions. Uh, and these emotions are evoked there to try to solve the problem of separation. Now, this might be with a, uh, with a new mother on a, or a mother of a three-year-old on a playground that wants the, the, uh, the three-year-old to get ready to go now, but the three-year-old is resisting. And so the mother uh, uh, plays the trump card, which is facing separation. Okay, then, honey, bye-bye. Uh, mommy's going, and maybe you disappear behind a tree or something like that. Oh, my goodness, this is a highly evocative uh, occasion, event. Uh, for the the uh, uh, for the three year old, what makes it so evocative? Facing separation, and togetherness would be more important with those that she is most attached to. So what happens is it highly alarms the child, it highly frustrates the child. But what is going to come up top right here, because it's most appropriate and it will be the bigger one, is it will evoke separation trigger pursuit. Mommy, mommy, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Uh, please wait, please wait, don't go. Mommy, I want to come with you. And so that is a closure thing. What was this meant to do? Situationally, it was meant to close the gap. It's to solve the problem. But these are pre-programmed solutions. You don't train a child to do this. Nature has given these emotions to solve the problem of separation. Why? Nature is trying to take care of us. But what we don't realize is that these three emotions are evoked at the same time, only though one can be expressed. So when that three-year-old gets home, if there's a little brother to hit or something to throw or something to strike, all of a sudden you're going to see this eruption of attacking energy. Why? Uh, because frustration did not solve the problem, but the problem with an emotion is that once it's evoked, uh, it carries a big punch. It is highly charged. It needs to be released in some way. That's the nature of emotion. It's like electricity. Once you've got that uh, that wave, uh, it's 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 got to go someplace. And so where does it go? Well, when it's residual, uh, when it turns foul, it erupts in attacking energy. So we got all the frustration-based things. And we can be packed full of this residual frustration, and young children can, even a toddler can. And the alarm often comes up after the frustration has been released. 
Now the residual alarm comes up, and there's monsters under the bed. And all of a sudden, you know, the child is full of, of well, what's going to happen to you? And all of these kinds of things full of alarming kind of energy that can come here. This is how big facing separation is. Now, again, I have a whole course about this, so I can't, I can't, I can't do anything else but summarize here. But the point is, is that these emotions are all triggered by facing separation, and bedtime is one of the first separations that children face. So you get the story. Now, bedtime problems alone are not going to drive all the kind of behavior I'm talking about, but it's facing separation, which we find to be at the root of an amazing number of human problems, of, of human troubles that are either alarm-driven, frustration-driven, or pursuit-driven. Uh, I, I'm not going to go over the details here. That's not the point. All that I want to, to do here is share with you the idea that that these problems go to the very core. We, they are what emotional health and well-being is about. Uh, some of the separation trigger pursuit problems, clutching, clinging, possessing, hoarding, acquiring, impressing, pleasing. We could go on and on. When it's residual, this energy becomes fragmented goes into fixes and fixations that even aren't recognized as their uh, pursuit uh, route to it. Winning, placing, hunting, chasing, attracting, demanding, reducing, seeking, enhancing. And then come the preoccupations with altering oneself close the gap so that one can belong or, or to conceal oneself so that in the search of love, of significance, so on. You get, you get the drift here, hopefully. Uh, the alarm-based problems. Oh my goodness, they're huge. Uh, irrational obsessions, irrational avoidance, anxiety, and anxiety-reducing behavior. Now, with anxiety-reducing behavior, of course, uh, this is probably the best uh, place to bring in thumb-sucking and, and the soothers. Uh, now, that often happens quite unbidden. <laughs> it's, you know, the... The child, the baby, uh, discovers their thumb, and the sucking response triggers a parasympathetic response, which reduces anxiety. Wow, that's addictive. Uh, and uh, later on, it, it uh, you know, it, it can, it, well, it, it also can be the pacifier or the soother and so on. Now, is the thumb sucking or control themselves? Well, your dentist may weigh in on an opinion on that. Uh, but apart from that, is it particularly harmful? Uh, not necessarily, but it is a sign that the child is highly alarmed. And if we don't read that sign, you know, and if we get too much into a battle of symptoms without going to the, the epicenter of the problem here is what? The child is facing separation. More separation than they can bear. The child is highly alarmed. Uh, so maybe we could find something uh, less uh, harmful to the teeth if it's used and less addictive, a transitional object. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but basically speaking, we want to use it as a sign that this child, maybe they're very sensitive, but is facing a bit more separation than they can handle. And that's what the point of this is, is we know where it's coming from. Then we know what to address. There's the frustration-based ones. Of course, facing separation frustrates us because togetherness is the most important thing. Even when the child is calling, Mommy, Daddy, and they don't reply a third time, you can hear the, you can first of all hear the alarm in their voice, Daddy, and then, Daddy! You can hear the alarm go, the pursuit go, because it goes louder. The alarm go when it, it goes, and then finally the eruption of attacking energy go. You can hear those things all in simply because of not being able to make contact. You can see how powerful and potent this is. And so, of course, this gives rise to a whole lot of, uh, of eruptions of attacking energy, fits and tantrums, hitting and fighting. Uh, obsessions with change, because that was the whole idea of it. If you change something, maybe it will fix it. Uh, but if we don't know what we're trying to change, then then changing everything, aggression and violence and on and on. The point here was not to go through this. I'm not meaning to do the intensive two all over again. Uh, the, the point is, is you can see how bedtime is related. Bedtime is connected to all of these things. It is not unconnected. It is connected. And so the issue here, when we see any signs of this, 
generally speaking, any sign of any of these problems is it's telling us the child is facing more separation than they can handle. It may be bedtime that they're doing it. It may be other kinds of separations. and But we'll take bedtime as a prototype. How would we reduce the separation phase? How can we reduce the separation phase? Well, I'll talk about three things here that are absolutely essential and that can be applied to most any problem of facing separation. And so if you can get it right for bedtime, uh, you can take it and apply it to the other areas that are there. Uh, maintaining a connection. Now, how do you maintain a connection when you are putting the child to bed and they can't be with you? They get, how do we do this? And if you, uh, how do you bridge the separation? That is huge. Uh, br uh, bridging should be one of our main uh, strengths uh, for helping the child face separation of bedtime. And then transitioning to the play mode. Uh, as we'll look at, play is, is amazing. There's a whole new science of play. And play is basically uh, a, a state of activated rest. And so we're going from work to activated rest to sleep. So it's the transition that happens. We mustn't go uh, from the work mode right to sleep. We've got to go through that transition of activated rest. But I'll start with maintaining a connection here. Uh, so how do we maintain a connection? Uh, the answer is provide other ways of staying connected when not in direct contact. That's the answer. Provide other ways of doing that. Well, how do you do this? Well, there's some time-honored ways. Take some time of yours. Give it to the child to take the bed, or if you have to go away, or they're going to the hospital. And in holding on to it, they are holding on to you. A locket, a picture of yours. Oh, there are so many stories. And as soon as I say this, I know you'll have all kinds of stories. Because you see, all of these are tucked into our intuition. But we lose it by thinking, we, we lose confidence. And my goodness, parents are losing confidence around bedtime. And that's one of the big issues is they're losing confidence. When we lose confidence, we lose access to our own intuition. We don't see ourselves as the answer anymore. And then we begin to ask people who are thinking too much from the head lose all of this. No, provide something special of yours for the child to take to bed with them. In holding on to it, they hold on to you. Uh, for the nonverbal ones, and even for the verbal ones, use some of your clothes, especially with your smells on it. Don't launder these clothes. You need your smells on it. Your, your nightie, your, your pajamas, whatever it is, to wrap around the child, preserving contact through texture and smell. That's powerful. I remember an uh, eleven-year-old. Uh, I was consulting with the parents around huge bedtime problems, and the mother says, "I think this may still work." Took her own own uh, nighty, gave it uh, for the eleven-year-old uh, to wear it uh, to bed uh, with her, and uh, and tuck around her, and it worked. Oh my goodness! You know what is it? Well, I've shared with others before. I. I I have done a lot of traveling before the pandemic and hope to do so again someday. Uh, I find it very, very difficult to sleep on my own. And so uh, on, at times I've been known to carry uh, my wife's pillowcase with me uh, because it has her smells. And when I put the pillowcase on my pillow, it's amazing how much my body likes that. All is well. The contact and closeness is there. And if this does, if this works for a 70-something-year-old, <laughs> it can work for, uh, you know, a seven-and-a-half-year-old, a seven-and-a-half-month-old, you get the drift. Uh, it, it, yes, we know these things somewhere deep inside. We just have to call them forth. Uh, the, the issue is, is how, how do I provide a sense of continuity when apart? singing through the house so they remain in sound so the child goes to bed but that's when you start singing 
You go all the way around doing whatever it is you need to do. You're at your office. You're doing things. Keep that humming going. No, not music on the radio. Your humming, your singing. Why? Because they remain in sound. You see, they're the four senses in sight, in smell, in touch, in, in sound, and in sound. If you can't do the other ones, then work in sound. From toddlerhood on, Use sameness as much as possible. As you go to bedtime, focus on, oh, we're just alike, you and I. Oh, we have this and that, and that's my favorite, and belonging, you know, the part of me, and and uh, and this. You work that sameness and belonging, because, again, we are the answer to those huge needs. That, that is the way that we're meant to keep close when apart, is we have a sense of being the same as, sense of being the part as. These are more evolved ways of staying close. So the toddler has these abilities. So you work them at bedtime. You work these ways. And when you work these ways, it takes the pressure off of being with. In smite, in sight, <laughs> in sight, in smell, in, in uh, in sound and touch, you 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 reduce uh, the need for that, and from this preschooler up, when the capacity for relationships should be there, you're always in my heart. The you know the answer to togetherness, having times of affection that focus on uh, the relationship uh, for for children when they a taste of emotional intimacy. When they finally realize that this kind of, this form invitation to exist in your presence exists whether they're with you or not, the forever nature of love and family, that moms and dads are your mom or dad, even if they're dead, they are. That's the beauty of family relationships there forever. You work this. You work this because this is the issue. This is the issue of transcending uh, the night, the separation time. Note, uh, acceptable substitutes can include transitional objects, uh, special blankets, fleeces, and stuffies. <laughs> or if you've got a cooperative pet, they can work miracles. Uh, the cat or the dog, they have to be cooperative, of course. Uh, but these should not be the preferred choice over you or compete with you. So make sure that you are the one that still can provide the greater comfort and so on. Uh, but uh, the research shows that children who do have access to a transitional object generally do better because we've got a lot of separations a child has to face. And, uh, and sometimes it's much easier if they have this transitional object. And of course, I need to mention this here. Of course, if choosing to sleep with a child or in the same room, as a practice or as needed, uh, make sure to stay in the lead with a generous invitation that is greater than the demand. I get all I used to get all kinds of questions as I, when I was in private practice. Are you sure this is okay? Yes, of course it's okay. If it's not going to lead to a divorce, if you're both on the same side, you sleep in a family bed, of, of course it's okay. It's the way we used to do it before we got rich enough to afford uh, more bedrooms. Uh, you know, the family bed was there. Yes, they passed a law in England after the Industrial Revolution uh, that you couldn't, uh, it was illegal for children to sleep in the same bed as parents, but that was because one or two had died from being rolled over, babies had been rolled over. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's a law anymore. If it is, I don't assume it's not, it's not ever applied. But the point is, is it's wonderful to have contact and connection. It's also very addictive. And you know that. It's also very addictive. Oh my goodness, have, am I addicted to it. Again, when I travel and I'm in, in the, these hotels, and all the smells are wrong, are, are wrong, and I'm in the bed alone. You know, wouldn't I? I, I, you know, most anything to to get my uh, my partner in bed, just to have that contact and closeness. I'll never forget when I was uh, uh, Shay, our our uh, youngest son. He, this was about thirty years ago now, I suppose, uh, somewhere around that mark. Uh, he was having a difficulty time, a uh, difficult bed, and he was saying to me, but Daddy, I'm lonely, you know. I feel so lonely at bedtime. 
And I decided to seize upon the moment to, to try to uh, impress upon him that loneliness was existential. I didn't use that word, but you know what I mean, that he should embrace loneliness, make friends with loneliness. He was going to have a lot of loneliness in his life. And so if he could just embrace it, make more room for his heart, then it wouldn't be such a big deal. You know, if you can, if you can give it a mile that only takes an inch, so to speak. Uh, and so I was doing this and, and he, he got very, very quiet. And I thought, ah, oh, I must be making headway here, you know, <laughs> talking to this this little this preschooler about about making room for loneliness. And he was very, very quiet. And then he finally said to me, shaking his head, he says, Daddy, it's not fair. I have to sleep alone and you get mommy. <laughs> it just broke me up. And it, it just he was right. He was right. What business do we as adults imposing upon our children? Something that must have been so artificial. No other mammals do this. You know, they have contact and closeness. So, of course, if you have the will, the willingness, the room, or in your same room, we used to have cradles by the bed. We used to have this. We couldn't afford it any other way. That was wonderful because it, it had this but. If you decide to do this, if it's okay with both of you, so your marriage is not at stake, and that's important, so your marriage is not at stake, make sure that you stay in the lead. Because the mistake with this is, you see, again, bedtime is supposed to be inevitable, inescapable, and so we need to adapt to it. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But we need to adapt to it. But we don't adapt when we're in charge. So somehow, I mean, when the child is in a charge, they can't adapt because they're in control. They're busy giving you instructions. That is difficult things. If you, if the child is in the lead, if I, you know, what I say to, to parents, often a, a child will get upended. You know, oh my goodness, an aunt has died or something. Uh, uh, they have experienced uh, facing separation. And now, you know, they've been able to sleep on their own. And all of a sudden, oh, in the middle of the night, you hear, you know, can I sleep in your bed, mommy? Can I sleep in your bed? Uh, they've been upended. And of course, we uh, we need to make room of this. But if we don't take the lead in this, if it's up to the child, Pretty soon the child becomes alpha, and you see the alpha child is never at rest. They, they can't rest because they don't feel taken care of. And so it's important to stay in charge. So if you are going, if it is okay with you, and if you're going to say, or maybe to an upended child who's faced more separation, and you know they may be seven, eight, nine of age but oh my goodness they need they they uh, that bedtime is all the alarm comes up because they're facing separation it brings the nightmares all the themes come again make sure you stay on the generous side of it of course you can in fact i'm going to come and check on you tonight in fact if i see you stirring i think i'll just take you by the hand and bring you to the bed you stay in the lead there always must be more than is demanded you read the needs of the child if you can see the child needs this uh, they're just not going to be able to do this if they need it you've got to jump to the lead in jumping to the lead you stay where you need to be we are that answer uh, that answer to what they need in this case, and that is providing the contact they need. So the basic thing here is stay in the lead with a generous invitation. Uh, if you start, uh, uh, if if the demands of the child start taking control of bedtime, it can go very bad. The demands of the child must not stay in control of bedtime. Again, bedtime represents everything in our life that is inescapable and you know is inevitable and so that has to be adapted to and again we'll get to that of how in the world do we foster adaptation at bedtime but this issue here is don't let your lead slip away read the needs but stay generous one step ahead uh, if you know the demand is going to come then make the invitation before they get the demand all of these and again I just show this roots diagram because it it shows up in almost almost all my courses. 
is uh, this roots diagram, in this case, of all the different ways of attaching. You start off in infancy with uh, with uh, being in sight and sound and hearing and touch. Uh, sound and hearing are the same in sight and smell, in, uh, in sound and touch, yes. And so we have uh, to be with. But by the time a child should be a toddler, this root should open up. Uh, in the uh, in the second year of life, to be the same as is a way of being close when not with. By the third year of life, this root should open up that great sense of togetherness when you are part of, uh, when you belong, part of the family, part of mom, part of daddy, uh, you're part of. And then by the fourth year, you should see that a child loves to be called by endearments uh, because it occurs to their brain uh, that anything that mommy and daddy hold dear, they hold close and so being dear to you being significant to you and so on. these are all ways you're waiting for you see what what the what the child has by the time they're in the fourth year if everything is unfolding well is three other ways of holding on to you when apart that should solve the bedtime issue unless of course we get up ended and then everything goes back to the beginning again it starts with oh we need to be with and so on and so on and that's okay a lot of times we need to start at the beginning again, and we should be willing to do so. By the fifth year of life, of course, the emotional intimacy. Oh, mommy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. They draw hearts for us. They give their hearts to us. And, and so on. And this is wonderful because this is the taste of the foreverness. Why? Because always in their mind, love is forever. Love is forever. It still is in our minds as well. You know, what we say to each other in a life partner is, is, is forever because it just goes together in our minds, even though we know in our heads it doesn't, it, in our hearts it does. It, it goes forever. This is, the, this is the part where the long arm of love, I called it and hold on to your kids. It's the long arm of love. I mean, a long arm of attachment, I mean. The love and, of course, having no secrets. All the ways that that evolve. The point here is there is a developmental resolution, and the point here is 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 also to address sometimes the reductionist nature of what people think is the answer. You see, if you're too reductionistic, you think well the answer is is physical contact and closeness that the child must uh, be in the in the sense to provide that physical contact and closeness uh, that touch. Now wait a minute. There's also, besides the touch, there's in sound, uh, there's in smell, uh, um, there's in, <laughs> which the one I'm missing? There, yeah, in sight. Of course, the sight that usually isn't there as well. Uh, uh, thanks to my producer who's sitting to the side who can fill me in on what I forget here. Uh, I shouldn't forget about the senses. Uh, but where was I going to? Oh, the reductionistic way of thinking here. The reductionistic way of thinking that it actually means the child sleeping in the bed. And this is why I want to point it out. Wait, there's other ways of providing contact and closeness. There's other ways of, of when the child can't be with, of being able to work. And working these are important. What the issue is, is that all of us need to have a sense of continuity of connection, a sense of continuity of togetherness with those, our, our loved ones, especially those who are responsible, we depend upon. We need to have a continuity of connection, and that's the challenge of bedtime. The challenge of bedtime is the continuity of connection. So if I can't be in sight, and if I can't be in touch, then how am I going to do this? And that's the question. Yeah, how am I going to do this? And that is a challenge. If I can figure that out, I'll be able to do a lot of things. But that is the issue. Uh, now, there's another way, another way that has uh, evolved in basically all traditional cultures is a way of being able to keep, when we're facing separation, a way to keep our faces from being pushed into it. And I call it bridging. The best example of bridging is the goodbye ritual. And goodbye it used to mean God be with you until we meet again. And it's that until we meet again is the key. You see, what it is, is it's, it's saying is, 
yes, I'm facing separation with you because why would you ever say goodbye unless you were facing separation? So goodbye is facing separation. But when you face separation, because uh, when you're attached, you attend to whom you attach. It gives the other person the power to take the attention. You take the attention of your child and it goes from the separation they're facing to what stays the same or the next point of connection. And that is the issue. You draw the attention, in this case, to what stays the same or the next point of contact. Now, it's a trick. Yes, it's a trick, but a trick that has been part of every single tradition why Be uh, of culture because a culture can't you can't do a culture how do you hold on to each other when life is fraught with separation is you draw the attention to the next point of connection and so you you i have here the bridge what stays the same or the next point of connection what stays the same you work whatever it is that you work with in this uh, we'll both be asleep, we'll do this. You work with whatever you do in terms of sameness. But it's the next point of connection that I, I is the most uh, important here uh, at bedtime, a bridging when separation. Employ the construct of the imminent return. You see, this is what we do when we say goodbye. I'm going to see you next on. Uh, look out for me then. I will, and this is so important. This is the way we should be doing life with our children. Always the next point when we leave them at school, daycare, always pointing to the next connection. When the hour turns there, I will be, and if it's too long, uh, let's think of each other. You know, when the hour strikes here, this is our magic hour, and we'll send thoughts to each other. Always to what's bearable, the construct of the imminent return. Absolutely essential in our basic religions. It, 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 they wouldn't be religions if it wasn't based upon this. Why? Because we're facing separation. Jesus, when he disappears in the skies, doesn't say so long, says, be back. Well, for the for in Judaism, uh, the Messiah is around the next corner. Or it's Jerusalem next year. In Islam, it gets better after death rather than less. It's always heading into more attachment, not less. And bedtime is a prototype of all of that is you figure out what your child can handle and you create the imminent return i'll be back to check you in a couple of minutes i've got another hug in me for you you just keep on going your wisdom is getting it right what is the parameter your child can handle to the imminent return somewhere along the line the brain gets it mommy and daddy are holding on to me they always come back. The brain goes into the sleep mode. Now, if it's a young toddler or preschooler, they ask you in the morning, Mom, did you check on me? Daddy, did you check on me like you promised? You know, make sure you do so you can honestly say, yes, I did. And make sure you can tell a story that I never had a, another hug in me and I gave it to you and so on and so forth. Whatever it is that's there so the child knows that you are the one holding on. But the imminent return is the issue of all separation. We build it even into our death time. Uh, those of you from a religious frame of mind is, you know, we'll see you yonder. We, we, we build it into everything. It is the way of doing separation. And so stay in the lead with this. But the imminent return is the key to facing separation that's inescapable, is inevitable, is you build out you build up the imminent return when the child is ready use fantasy and imagination to set the next contact point whether it's see you in my dreams or however and uh, when even more ready you set the sights on a friendly morning connection that can now bridge the night uh, i'll have your favorite breakfast uh, ready for you etc uh, etc et make it a friendly kind of connection that they can wake up to you build it that way 
And of course, as I said before, be prepared to take a tactical retreat to frequent returns when a child has become upended or faced more separation than they could handle. Bedtime isn't a smooth thing. You, 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 you have a child who actually is, oh, okay, now they can relax. You've got the transition time going. They fall asleep. And then something happens at school. Something happens with the re- friend uh, they hear uh, grandma is sick and it all gets upended of course because it's all about facing separation and in bedtime is a thermometer of it it's the barometer of it and so in bedtime will be where you actually feel it and where you have to do the treatment again because when you treat it you're treating all the other separations that the child is facing and so the final one, transition to the play mode. Now, how is this reducing separation? Well, just like bridging, you're not reducing separation directly. What you are doing is in the play mode, which is a state of activated rest. What is that rest? It's a child, The it, there's, there's uh, according to one of the developmentalists, David Elkine, there's three basic drives. Uh, the attachment drive, uh, the work drive for achievement, and the play drive. Now, when, when the amygdala moves into the play, play drive, which is the drive of active rest, it, it puts to rest this intense pursuit of proximity and consciousness about the separation being faced, and it also puts to rest uh, any kind of outcome-based list plans, agendas, what we're going to do tomorrow, and all of these kinds of things. It puts to rest that. So it is the place that you go in transition. One of the big mistakes a lot of adults make is they work right up till the point they go to sleep. We're not meant to do this. We're meant to have the transition time. That's one of the great problems with screen time because screen time is outcome-based playing. Much of the screen games are outcome-based. They're not relaxing. Anything that's addictive is not true play. True play is never addictive, and we'll take a look at the properties in, in just a minute of true play, but we need a transition time. And that transition time is a state of of true play. When you're reading something that doesn't count, when you're not trying to solve a problem for real, uh, is singing a restful game, not not a game full of, uh, uh, of a sympathetic nervous system activity, but a restful game, uh, drawing, creating anything that actually you can feel this, this state of activated rest. Uh, that is is so important as a transition time for for it. Now, the kind of play I mean here is a play that has these seven seven properties. Uh, play is always engaging. That's why it's so wonderful. Is even though the child's facing separation, play is so engaging that if you can get it right, if you can get the stories right, if you can get the songs right, if you can get the all of the things that are in the play mode, it will be so engaging. And what is engaging about it is the activity. It's not outcome-based. And that is the definition of play, is you're not thinking about the outcome, you're not thinking about the work. You're actually, it's the activity that's engaging. So a child can play a board game, and if they're playing to win, that's outcome-based. That is work for them, not play. And you'll see all the work energy in it. But if it's, the, if it's play for play's sake, it is the activity that satisfies. Now, it's not for real, and that's a beautiful thing, because they are facing separation for real here. But this isn't for real, that saves them from it. And so play is in a bubble of non-reality. It doesn't count for real. i uh, give you an example. Two sisters can be sisters for real. But when they're playing sisters, and they argue, and they scream each other, mom and dad may say, come on, you guys, stop fighting. Their response would be, um, it's okay, we're only playing. In other words, it doesn't count for real. It's expressive. All the emotions that need to come that have been collecting through the day. You see, they get hooked on a story. They get hooked on a piece of music. Uh, they get to be out. This is the beauty, beautiful thing. It's expressive. Not stimulating. That won't help us sleep. It has to be an opportunity for something inside out safe. That is huge for sleep. Uh, if feelings get hurt, uh, uh, then uh, it's not safe. It doesn't mean it's physically safe. You can think of other kinds of play. It means emotionally safe. Feelings don't get hurt. If they do get hurt, it's not play. And beautiful about it, the will is preserved. When a child is in the play mode, they have the sense of being in the driver's seat. Now, the fact is, is they're not 
in control. <laughs> they have to sleep one third of our life. We sleep. Oh my goodness. And it's inescapable and it's inevitable and we must or else we, our brain doesn't function. It has to shut down. It has to sleep. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it happens to us. We're not free. We don't have control over this. You know, this is, this is in our face, but in the play mode, you don't experience it. That's why the play mode is always the key when something is inescapable, inevitable. Uh, we've got to go to the car now. You've got to put your seatbelt on. The next thing that comes out of you when you've just pushed their face into what they can't control should be who can get to the car first. Because when you bring play in, all of a sudden, all of the coerciveness disappears. Now they are in control, and this is a game. It doesn't count for real. It's engaging, and so on. And all the counter will just disappears. And so that's why play is so important, because otherwise, the minute you say, you must go to sleep, even to ourselves, we can't go to sleep. Why? Because it evokes counter will. None of us likes to be told what to do, including ourselves to ourselves. It's one of the greatest mistakes. I have to go to sleep now. Well, okay, that's the end. That won't work. And so we mustn't say it to our children as well. Well, the uh, <laughs> I... This was looking at, at play as being an answer, but this is the last part of my address here, and probably in many ways the most significant part of it. I tried to save the best for last. I hope you'll think it that way. In addition, some sadness may also be required. Now, you've got to say, Dr. Dufault, you've got to be kidding. This is not a time for negative emotions at bedtime. <laughs> you know, that's not going to work. I, and anyway, how in the world do you do that sadness and so on? Just hang on. Just hang on. In addition, some sadness may also be required. Why? Well, feelings have a lot to do, and sadness has probably more work to do than any other single uh, feeling in, in our system. To cleanse the emotions that have been triggered by facing separation. You see, if they can't fix a problem, they need to come to an end. And the only end the brain knows is that a futility is felt. That's where you feel sadness. That's where, in a young child, the, the tears get moist, the tears come. It is the end to, to that emotion. So it's to cl cleanse leftover alarm, frustration, and pursuit uh, that can drive the fears, the monsters under the bed, and make children very hard to manage. Oh my goodness, we need this. We need this. Like this, 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 uh, this sadness. We need to do regular cleanup, cleanup work with these leftover emotions in us as adults. We do to bring rest to the futile endeavors, including to avoid sleep, because it's only you see futility needs to be actually felt. It's not enough to know something. Adaptation, which sadness is in charge of, is an emotional process. And we need to feel the futility. That is why the sadness needs to be there. The sadness needs to be there to actually feel it. That's when it goes from autonomic nervous, a sympathetic nervous system to parasympathetic. Because these tears of sadness or the, the, the sadness that can be the tears on the inside, this is all parasympathetic nervous system activity. This is in the rest mode. And it's in the rest mode that we surrender. You see, it's not because, and let me straighten this out. This is really important here. We have to feel sad in order to let go. And this includes in grief and loss and death and all of these things. We have to feel sad in order to let go. It's not, we think that we need to let go. And when we will, we'll feel sad. No, no, we need to feel sad in order to let go. What is the most important thing to let go of trying to hang on to everything, all the plans, all the futilities of consciousness and so on? It is bedtime. That is the time of little surrender. So trying to hold on to wakefulness for them is like trying to hold on to life for us. There is a time of surrender, even in terms of mortality. There's a time of surrender. And of course, to foster the resilience to face the bedtimes of the future and all the separations of future. Uh, sadness is the most important in building resilience and cultivating because our brain registers when we feel sad that we've survived whatever we had to feel sad about. And that is key to resil resilience. Now, sadness is the most pivotal, the most profound, the most powerful, the most problematic in our culture, at least, 
and the most misunderstood, but I couldn't get it to rhyme with P, so you saw my problem on the slide. The most misunderstood of all human feelings. So here we have two challenges. The two challenges in addressing bedtime problems. The first challenge is to reduce the separation phase. Hopefully, hopefully you've got that. That's fairly obvious. And now I hopefully convinced you in very short time that some sadness is needed. But again, you know, your response, but you've got to be kidding. You know, the bedtime and sadness, you've got to be kidding. It would be cruel to make the child uh, cry at bedtime and certainly be assured right now, I, you do not, it, letting a, a child cry it out alone is not what I'm talking about. So don't even go there. Don't even go there. Hang on what I'm doing. What I am doing is making a pitch for the oldest bedtime instrument technique strategy ever. And in every traditional culture. What is it? It's the bye-bye. That's the lullaby. It's the lullaby. It's perfectly suited to prime sadness as well as reduce the separation faced at bedtime. Now, granted, sadness is a bit of a rough trip. It's not somebody you can't say to say, you've got to feel sad about this. You'll never surrender. You'll never let go. You, you, you don't say it directly. It has to be indirect. That's why probably lullabies are universal. They exist in every culture and have been passed on through the generations. Now, when I, as soon as I say this, you know, we've lost it in the last generation or so, but as soon as I say this, I know many of you will be full of stories because you'll remember the lullabies that were sung to you or that tradition has in, in your own family. And let me just go very, we can make a whole course of this, but let me just go through this very briefly to give you a sense of this. The oldest lullaby actually we have on record is over 4,000 years, uh, years old. It is thought that the lullaby, there's a new science of music and a science of lullaby, that the lullabies are thought to be the genesis of all song. And the etymology of lullaby, the origins, are from the same word in many languages as lament or dirge or requiem, but lament, that is, again, looking at the little death and the big death. So what I'm saying here, it is the oldest and most traditional instrument for getting children to sleep, and for good reason, which has now been evidenced by this development, developing science of music. And so I want to bring you back to something that probably everybody knows, but you didn't know why it was so important. The lullabies, first of all, are being found to be written in the key of sadness. What do we mean by that? Well, we're not sure why it is so, but almost all lullabies must, maybe intuitively, are written in the minor third, which seems to attract sadness with a slow tempo and a simple repeated pattern sung softly and intimately with gently lilting and rocking motion you get this in, you can even do nonsense syllables, you can do anything, you just get the pattern of the lullaby, and oh my goodness, it starts coming to you. And there's this melancholy in it. Even Plato said, somehow, the music can, make, uh, can give sadness a charm. It can make sadness sweet. There's something about this that is there, but it evokes the sadness. The lullaby, because it is essentially, it obeys all the seven properties of play, and in play you have the sense of safety. It weaves a spell of emotional safety, even though one is facing separation. This is quite a paradox, quite an irony, that the lullaby can make us feel safe, making it easier to feel the deep longing that comes in the face of separation together with the melancholy that comes from its unattainability. George Eliot said it wonderfully, only in the agony of parting do we look into the depths of love. And so as we face a separation, there's an, oh, this longing, this yearning, and somehow it has to be born. It has to be sweet. The melancholy magic of the lullaby is that it can make, it can make sadness so sweet that it can even entice. It can even entice. So lullaby, a lullaby brings sadness to the occasion. 
which is exactly what is needed. It, it is the dance of surrender. In fact, it can provide the opportunity for the singer to introduce alarming things that will need to be faced and adapted to. They can only be mentioned once the lullaby has cast its spell of safety and sadness. You all know about this, of course, about the cradle that drops, right? Baby and all. But it's mentioned in the context of the lullaby that is there. Doris Day in that case, Sarah, Sarah. Uh, a lullaby that was actually constructed for that uh, Hitchcock movie way back. I think it was in the 1940s, if not before. I forget the, when it was. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. It defines what has to be adapted to. It points, to, it, points it to, in a sense, it's a prototype in this way, as many lullabies actually do. If you go look at them, uh, they do. And, and, and many lullabies will actually invoke sadness. For instance, William Blake's Cradle Song invokes sadness. There's an invitation. Sleep, sleep, beauty bright. Dreaming o'er the joys of night. Sleep, sleep. In thy sleep, little sorrows sit and weep. And again, you see this. The study of lullabies is wonderful. I, I'm getting into this now, as you can see. And uh, so I could have a whole lot to share. I'll, 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 I'll need to get myself the courage to sing you some lullabies so you can get the sense. I'm not quite there yet. Maybe uh, maybe the next uh, uh, edition of this. Uh, uh, you know. But this would be enough for the lullaby. If this was a commercial... And in many sense, I feel like I'm an advocate for this, right? It would be if you hear, hear these info commercials, but wait, 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 there's more, there's more. And so I would say, wait, 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 uh, yo, this is, this is enough. A lullaby bringing sadness to this place, this dance of surrender, all indirect. Uh, the child doesn't know what hit him. We don't know what hit us. And suddenly we're able to let go. We're able to let go. Oh my goodness, as sadness does its work. But there is more. There is more. And let me just briefly go how lullabies reduce the separation faced. Because lullaby does the work of bridging. It diverts attention away from the separation being faced as music grabs our attention. And it puts the focus on what is intimately shared in common, the experience of the lullaby. So it does the bridging. It also, and this is more a theory that some are coming to, and it makes a lot of sense to me, it's like it reactivates the primordial connection because what we found is that the baby isn't responding to the mother's voice, the fetus, in, in the womb, but to the musical characteristics of the voice. And it's the musical characteristics, the, the, all of the things that we would define as music. And it is that, it is the music, which is the first language we now know. Music is the first language. Uh, it way predated any kind of text. It's also the first language of connection. That this is what created the first connection with the, with the, uh, the fetus and the mother. And so there's this sense of this, this experience of primordial fusion this experience of, of temporary, uh, you know, fusion of being safely cocooned. Uh, pardon me here, some of you this may not have worked for, uh, but it, I, I think of it something like sex. Uh, now, what about sex? Well, it's that momentary experience, and a good, good sex I'm talking about, momentary experience of absolute fusion. Now, we know we're separate, but it's that fusion. That fusion, that momentary, there's no nothing between. There's no boundaries that's between, which, which must be the ultimate enticement of this, of, of this experience, to ex experience this nothing in between. And of course, this is, this is, again, as I say, could this be the ultimate enticement of that lullaby in many ways? Uh, I, I think so. And then finally, it also gives priority that the message of connection, if any, being delivered through the lyrics. 
And so if you are creating a connection, if you're making up your own lullaby, and I challenge you, everybody should make up their own lullabies. It, they're so simple. They're wonderful. Uh, you can make this up what it is that you, you want to say, uh, but you make this up. You can, you can embed a message there. Uh, take, for instance, Billy Joel's lullaby to his daughter after his breakup with Christy Brinkley. Now, he, like any dad or, or mom, would have said, honey, I'll never leave you. And now he is separated, separating, and he won't be with his daughter. How do you do this? Many of us have been in this situation. How do you do this? And he creates this lullaby. And in the lullaby, he actually catches some of the main themes that a lullaby is meant to sing. If you sing this lullaby, one of the final lines go, in your heart, there will always be a part of me. The music goes on, the music goes on, the lullaby, the memory. It's something of his to hold on to, you see, because he created it for her. And when she holds on to it and sings it, in holding on to it, he, she holds on to him. You know, there's many stories of grown adults still holding on to something of their own parent that way. And the clothes, the clothes, it gets me all the time. Someday we'll all be gone. The big, the big one. And the line goes, lullabies never die. That's how you and I will be. The relationship has transcended it. The relationship is there. The relationship does not die. Relationships do not die. And that's the whole point. Uh, again, beautifully capturing it. Uh, well, uh, just a bit, I I. There's a whole lot here, but I think you'll get this here. How how lullabies, I mean, there's even more. If I want to say, wait, there's more, <laughs> right? The lullaby set the stage for sleep, puts the brain and body into the play or rest mode in preparation for sleep, and it does it wonderfully. It, it uh, disengages the attachment drive with its incessant proximity seeking. It is so engaging, and it disengages the others. Music engages, and the science of music says it's the only activity we know that will engage the whole brain. Now, it's the first thing, first thing in music we remember uh, when somebody suffers from Alzheimer's. It's the last way to access their memories. Ac last way to even access them is through music. Music engages the whole brain, orchestrating neural activity and synchronizing brain waves. The play mode neutralizes the troublesome counterwill instinct. Uh, that's the part where you have to, right? I have to go to sleep. You have to do this. It's always a mistake to, to bring our will, uh, to push our child into our will there. But if you do, make sure you follow it up by play right away because that disengages counterwill. And so then it doesn't become the agenda. Uh, it, uh, as soon as you will it, uh, something crazy goes on with sleep because counterwill comes to the fore. It disengages the work drive with its outcome-based obsessions, plans, lists, and agendas that can keep many of us uh, uh, awake and our children awake. The lullaby music can penetrate deeply into the brain, including the cerebellum, where, by the way, the sleep switch is located. So it reaches deep and evokes a sensation of being gently rocked. That's the whole idea. When you start singing a lullaby, you find yourself starting to rock. You know, when somebody else starts singing a lullaby, I start rocking. You can see how absolutely it is. That music was meant to move us, and nothing moves us better than that slow rocking that can happen, help soothe alarm and agitation. The lullaby is undoubtedly our best bet for slow dancing our child to sleep. Those who need a science uh, for it before they will go, because this is just old wives stuff and so on, believe me, I have been researching in this and the science is emerging. It's like a whole new discovery. You put this together with this. Not only this, but of the value it does mothers. I, I just want to draw attention to here. Uh, our time is, is pretty well up here, but draw attention to one of the, the most exciting projects as far as I'm concerned. Started in 2011. The Lullaby Project uh, from the New York's Carnegie Hall. These are uh, uh, musicians, uh, a group of musicians. Uh, who put together a project 
uh, for troubled mothers, uh, street mothers, mothers in prison, uh, hospitalized mothers, young mom, uh, mothers in school, using lullabies to soothe troubled young mothers. Now they were astute enough uh, to uh, actually have research to go along with it. So now you can read about this. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, Google it and find out about it. But professional songwriters meet with troubled pregnant women and new mothers to write, perform and record a custom original lullaby for their upcoming child or their, their expected child or the, their existing child, which is then archived in Carnegie Hall. They have, uh, uh, they have 10 years of these now. The lullabies are not only used during pregnancy and to lull the child uh, to sleep, but as a bridge over troubled waters for both the mother and the child and the testimonies, they just send tingles down my spine. They bring tears to my eyes. I, I'll let you read this. But the point is, as you see, is this, oh my goodness, it's not just for them. It's for us as well. Sometimes we need this. And what a project. Oh, what a project. Uh, so I have a final slides, which I'll just bring. We said it was a little death, so just a couple of slides about death, and we'll bring this. Uh, I mean, I mean you know, death, we could talk a long time about our mortality, and there's uh, all the poetry that is there. The thing about it, you see, is we can't, we can't look at it too directly, just like the sun. It's just, uh, we, can't, we, can't, we can't sustain it. It is the reality. It defines our life. The moment we're born, we're going to die. It defines everything in life. Oh, we can't look at it. We can't look at it. We need help. We need help. We need the poetry. We need the play. We need help. And music comes to the rescue again. Lullabies in their cousin form, the lament. Uh, some traditional cultures have their own names for the Portuguese culture, Fado, uh, the dirge, the requiem, whatever it's called. Uh, I just brought this image here, music as Destula, uh, a self-portrait uh, in 1872 uh, by the, uh, uh, the artist here as a self-portrait. Um, by the doula, I meant uh, helps to deliver the sadness that in turn we need uh, to, uh, to, uh, to adapt us to our mortality, to deliver the sadness that is required uh, to be able to look at it. Uh, and again, if it can do it for mortality, the ultimate of the separations we face, it can surely do it with uh, bedtime and anything in between, including the little losses and lacks. And here I just put some of the thoughts together. And, and uh, uh, if you're interested in, in pursuing it, this book out of Australia, The Singing Death, Reflections on Music and Mortality, just recently published. I lifted this quote from it. The inescapable grief of bereavement and human mortality seems to require music accompaniment. It's a, it's a, it's a, a beautiful, there's some studies in it, but there's also a lot of stories in it. It, it kind of bridges it from, uh, from science to art. Um, again, I'll just read this. We have difficulty facing death and mortality directly as it is too much to bear. Um, music in the play mode is so engaging that it cannot be re resisted, and that is its beauty. The power of the mythical sirens was that their music was more engaging than death was alarming. In times past, uh, it has been through laments, dirges, requiems, and music, uh, musical el uh, elegies, uh, through songs and instrumentals that stir our sadness and move us to melancholy. And sadness is the only resting place for problems with no solution. But sadness often needs music to be felt. Uh, so with that, I'll end this. Appropriate way to end this, hopefully. Um, Maybe a little, little over the top for some, but you'll just subtract the last two slides then if it was a little over the top for you. Weren't ready for that one. Uh, I can understand. Uh, I'm 75, though. It's a little bit different, you see, for me, is uh, that it's always there. I look and, you know, it's, it's, it's like instead of looking up to life is forever, it's, ah, you're going down. So it's always there in the background, but I need music. I need music. I can't, I can't look at it directly. I need the music. So getting bedtime right, hopefully I can convince you there's all kinds of reasons for this. Reduce the separation where you can. Bridge the separation that is unavoidable and inescapable. And use, use music to prime the sadness that is needed to prepare the way uh, to let go. Uh, getting bedtime right is preparation for all the inevitable, inescapable, and seemingly intolerable 
separations that follow, including having to face the ultimate and final separation of all. Well, I hope that making sense of bedtime and the nature of the monster that lies under the bedtime construct. Uh, it's not just monsters under the bed, it's monsters under the construct of bedtime. That this has given you a sense of how to approach this experience with your child. Uh, in fact, again, if you get bedtime right, it will develop a whole philosophy approach uh, to your parenting. Uh, uh, and so getting it right as well as all the myriads of experiences that share the same threat. Uh, thank you for giving me the time to share what I consider to be a, f a fairly significant information. It may have seemed to have been, oh, you know, just some people have those problems. But I think if you understand what I'm talking about, it's, it is the prototype problem we face as humans. Thank you.